This episode may contain sensitive language not suitable for children. Hello, and welcome back to Season 2 of Through Black Eyes and Filtered the podcast that brings truth to light. Listen to present-day historical events that shaped our history and will determine our future. It's presented by moderator Raymond Dunn and expert Marvin Dunn. I am Dr. Marvin Dunn. I'm the author of several books dealing with black history in Florida. The first book was on the Miami Riot of 1980, Crossing the Bounds. It was written by myself and Bruce Porter. I've also written Black Miami in the 20th Century, and it deals with the history of lynching in Florida. And my latest book is called A History of Florida Through Black Eyes, and it traces the history of blacks in Florida from the arrival of black people with the Spanish. These books are available on Amazon. This episode, we will continue part two of the history of slavery. Let's get started. Ray, let me just mention to people that what we're talking about is covered in my book, A History of Florida Through Black Eyes, available on Amazon. All the uh, details that we're talking about are in the book in considerable detail. Okay. I encourage our listeners to read the book, pick it up, call us, write comments about it. Dr. Dunn will reply to your comments. Marvin, compare the task uh, yeah, system yeah. to the gang, gang system. system. Let's start with that. Slave masters had two ways to go about working their slaves. The method that most of them used was called the gang system, mm-hmm. where you had mostly men, the large numbers of men, working under a, a driver. That's the name of the person that drove the slaves. And there was no specific task. The gang just worked from dawn to dusk, uh, if not beyond, and they never finished. They always had work to do. This was a sort of inhumane way to work people. It didn't give them any free time. Uh, there was no sense of completion of anything that you did. It was not a way to have a family. If you're living in a big barn with 80 other men, that limited your access to build a family and have a social life. Right. But it was the most efficient way to get a lot of work done if you didn't care about how the people felt about it. Right. Uh, So the gang system was pretty popular in the South. The second uh, way that slave masters could work their their slaves was called the task system. And in the task system, individual slave had a job to do, a task. And once he or she finished his or her task, you were done for the day. And slave masters, not all of them did this, but many of them did it. Um, Slaves who finished their tasks could then take care of their own gardens. They could stay home. They could make things that they could sell to other slaves or other plantations or even to white people. So some slaves were able, because of the task system giving them free time, were able to make money and then purchase themselves out of slavery. All right. So so the task system was provided, Ray, a motivation, an incentive Mm -hmm. for the slaves to work. And the other did not. You know, one of the stereotypes about black people today is that we were lazy. But think about that. If you were a slave working under the tasks, uh, under the uh, gang system, which is what system is used with most of them, why would you get up and want to rush out to work? What's you're in it for you? Finish, anyway, and, and tomorrow you're going to start at the same place. Exactly. So enslaved when drivers, the, guys, the people who had to make the slaves work, complained that the slaves were slow and they wouldn't get up and they were claiming to be sick. They had no reason, no incentive to do anything that the drivers wanted them to do. And then some slaves would sabotage the system, the plantation, to keep them working. Then you may want to explain to our audience why it was preferable to be a house nigger. Let's talk about how some of these slaves on the gang systems managed to not have to work. Okay. Poison the mule. Mm -hmm. Make the mule sick. Mm -hmm. Damage the equipment. Break the wagon wheel, bend the axle. Absolutely. You, you can't transport right. them. Right. And then the slaves who worked in the house, we talk about house Negroes and field Negroes, also had ways of sabotaging the masters. Why are you cleaning that up to house Negroes and slave Negroes when everybody knows the saying? Tell your audience what it meant All and right. what it is. <clears throat> Plantations had um, a, a caste system, a class system of, among slaves. There were slaves who worked in the house, and these were slaves who attended to the personal needs of the master. They were butlers and cooks and maids, coachmen, what have you. Uh, And they they didn't live in the house, but they worked in the house. They were around white people uh, providing for their needs. And house Negroes had a certain, had a number of advantages. The work was not as hard. Many of them ended up learning skills that 
enabled them to do better after slavery because they've been trained in certain kinds of domestic tasks, for example. The house Negroes had a much greater chance of being bred by the master, All right. of having an interracial with children because of the advantage that the masters could take of them because they were in the house with them. Exactly. So over time, these Negroes who were house Negroes had better jobs, a little bit of education compared to field Negroes, uh, had closer ties to the white families through race mixing, and had a much better future when slavery was over because they had talents and training that others didn't have. The field Negroes, which is what most Negroes were, field Negroes, but field Negroes were the ones that didn't come into the house. And listen, white people didn't want dark-skinned slaves in the house. So house Negroes Tend to be tended to be light skinned, right? Because the white people didn't want a very dark black person serving them dinner. They didn't want their guests to have to have a very black maid or cook uh, bringing in the food. So they tended to either breed their own house Negroes, and once slave owners got into breeding, they had a lot of incentive to breed racially mixed slaves because they were more profitable on the slave market mm -hmm. because slave owners tended to want mixed slaves, mixed blood slaves to be house Negroes. You had developed a natural animosity between slaves who worked in the house and slaves who worked in the field. And that led to some feelings that still exist today, that the lighter the skin of a black person, well, that person is more privileged than the darker person. Well, that's the way it turned out. Okay, so that, but that's basically where that started, right? It is, it is. When, listen, when slavery ended, a number of slave masters owned their children, their race, their half black children, half white children, gave them land, that, gave exactly. them property. And, mm -hmm. So all the white uh, masters, all the masters who, pr who propagated slaves, Mixed blood slaves did not just cast them away. Not, you know, mm -hmm. Some of them instilled in those in their mixed race offspring uh, advantages that field Negroes uh, did not have. So I, I, I want to make it very clear because the record shows again and again and again that mixed race descendants of slave masters often got land okay. at the end of slavery okay. and also uh, were more likely to be freed. Okay, uh, let me move you to another uh, topic. Mm -hmm. What were the most dangerous jobs or tasks that slaves had to perform? Rice. What? Working in rice. Why was that so dangerous? Water, mosquitoes, malaria. Oh, slaves oh. died from malaria. Rice. You didn't want to go to a rice field. South Carolina, oh my gosh, you think about the slaves off the coast of Ca in South mm -hmm. Carolina where a lot of rice was grown. Uh, they didn't know what was killing the slaves. But if you went onto a plantation that grew rice, the slaves were sicker, they looked feeble, the babies died much sooner because the mothers were weak from malaria. So you, you have a sick mom, gives birth to a baby, and the baby dies because the mother wasn't able to provide the nurturance that the baby needed to survive. So the death rate among infant slaves was astronomical compared to cotton Mm -hmm. workers. And you know, some of the Native American people knew had ways to deal with mosquitoes that they taught the slaves. For example, one of the things that really uh, repelled mosquitoes was bear fat. Kill a bear and take the fat and rub it all over mm -hmm. your skin and it tended to repel mosquitoes. There were also certain plants that the Indians knew that they would make an actual headband out of these particular kinds of plants that they knew repelled um, mosquitoes. So in some tribes you would see little kids running around with little necklaces made of these particular plants. Uh, some of that got to slaves so they learned how to sustain themselves and, and against that disease. But rice was a, a killer. Cotton, yeah. cotton wasn't as bad in terms of deaths. But if you pick cotton, uh, very few people listening to this ever picked cotton. I never picked it either, for that matter, to tell the truth. Well, I, I did it just uh, as a tourist passing through. Yeah, well, I, I guess I did that. I went. I did do that. But the cotton plants have thorns. So if you are sent out into a cotton patch to work to pick cotton, you're going to come back with bloody hands. And even though the slaves tried to have mittens and things that they could try to make to protect themselves from the thorns, there was no escaping the physical damage of working in a, in a cotton patch. And then getting those sores uh, cuts infected. And but people had ways of dealing with it, uh, with infections. Um, uh, I've learned so much about how plants like rosemary was used throughout the South to fight uh, infections and other kinds of diseases. So they had root women or root mm -hmm. doctors mm -hmm. who really provided a lot of the health care from the natural environment that the slaves needed. Uh, let's take a step up from Rosemary. How was pot used? Marijuana? Uh, marijuana. You sure you want to talk about that? Tell these young listeners about marijuana and its connection to slavery. Marijuana was used to pacify slaves. Marijuana was used on slave ships to have the slaves be less problematic during the Middle Passage. Marijuana was given to slaves um, at auction so that when they were put on the block, they might be less difficult to deal with. They were also given liquor. 
whiskey as well. But many slave masters used uh, marijuana expansively among their slaves. As a matter of fact, South Carolina, even when it was a British colony, most of the marijuana that was grown to be used to pacify slaves was grown in South Carolina. But many of the plantations simply grew their own marijuana. The slaves brought marijuana in from the Caribbean, where it was being widely used by the native population. And um, over time, those plants reached the southern colonies and were propagated and used very effectively. Let me move you quite a bit forward, but you're, you're talking about the two major crops, well, the three, mm-hmm. rice, uh, tobacco, cotton. Tell us about how they, uh, they processed the cotton, because I'm interested in what role Eli Whitney played and what happened with oh, that. That was one person history could have done without. It's a very tedious process to pick cotton and then separate out mm-hmm. the, the, the cotton, the fibers from the leaves and the trash and all that. And that had to be done by hand. Mm-hmm. And that took a lot of time to accomplish. And then Eli Whitney, I've forgotten the year that he invented the cotton gin, uh, cut through that process. The gin was able to move the cotton through, separate out the debris, and end up giving you clean cotton to be baled and then sold. So with the invention of that particular piece of equipment, the demand for slaves really just skyrocketed. You know, before that, they weren't growing cotton in certain inland areas like some of the states that were coming on in, into the Union. But with the invention of the of the cotton gin, uh, more land was opened up for, for cotton and obviously money made because of, of, of that. It was called long staple cotton. Mm-hmm. Um, cotton came two ways, long staple and short staple. So the cotton that had the longest staples were the finest cotton and, and, and tend to be sea island cotton. And the just common cotton was uh, was used with the cotton gin. You couldn't use the cotton gin with the long staple cotton. But you know, just the fact that Eli Whitney, a black man, made the first cotton gin. Now correct me if I'm wrong now. I thought he was a white man. Eli Whitney is a black man. He he made the first cotton gin was made by a black man and then a white man. Oh, that's different. another story. No, no, no. Okay, all right. Yeah, that all part right. is true. Oh, okay, tell me. That happened with a lot of inventions. Yeah, that, exactly. That, that the, black the first sh- shoot, shoemaking machine, the, uh, the traffic light. Jack Daniels bourbon. So yes, I, I, I don't doubt that Whitney had help from slaves, but he on his own right to be to give the man credit. That was that's what that was what he did, mechanical stuff. And I'm sure he did get help, but I don't think he I think it was a white man who used his black slaves to get the technique together to be able to gin the cotton better. But I think he was white. What is a carpetbagger? Well, uh, when the Civil War ended, the Union had to control the South. You know, mm-hmm. The states were devastated. There were no state governments. It was just a mess. So the federal government sent these people throughout the South to manage local affairs. And because many Northerners who came into the South, and many of them carried their belongings in what looked like a bag made from carpet. So they became known as carpet baggers. But they were not welcome in the South. They were seen as invaders. They were seen as radical Republicans, as uh, nigger lovers. And some of them probably did meet those dis- descriptions. But the carpet baggers had power. They could come into a county like Dade County. Uh, we had William Gleason. As so, so we actually had a carpet bagger in Miami. William Gleason was okay. the, he was actually, I think, responsible for most of Florida, but certainly for, for, for South Florida. A white man, I'm not sure where Gleason was from, but he did what some of them did came in and misused his power. Now, what the carpet bagger William Gleason did in Miami was, in Dade County, was to appoint two slaves to public positions. He appointed a slave as superintendent of education. This is in the 1870s now. And he appointed another black man as a county commissioner and then took whatever power that that, that came to them, he then, he then used it. So it was just in name only. The black man that he named, former slave that he named as superintendent of schools, couldn't read and write. Mm. So there were instances in which the carpet baggers came in and were abusive in their authority and their power. I don't think that was generally true, but mm-hmm. it didn't take but one or two instances for it to become basically accepted among Southerners that these abuses were, were, were taking place. But the carpetbaggers basically went in before the states were reconstituted, readmitted to the Union, 
presumably ran local governments. Okay, so this was a part of or pre-Reconstruction? This was Reconstruction. Okay. Yeah, the war ended in 1865, mm-hmm. so we're talking about the late 1860s mm-hmm. and early 1870s. And then by, what, 1877, the carpetbaggers were gone. The Union troops were out of the South. Mm-hmm. Uh, the resurgence of the Democratic Party, the arrival of the Ku Klux Klan, all these things then happened after the Union left the South. Okay, so, so tell us about some of the important and recognizable uh, black figures during Reconstruction. Construction. Who were some of these people, Mom? Uh, Jonathan Gibbs was a black um, superintendent of education for the state of Florida. Okay. Jo- Josiah Walls was a congressman, a black man, uh, lived near Gainesville. Gibbs was the most important one. Uh, Gibbs and, and Walls were not put-ups. These were educated men. These, mm-hmm. Jonathan Gibbs was the superintendent of schools for the state of Florida who made textbooks uniform across the system. Mm-hmm. Um, very effective administrator. And uh, I, I know. I lived in, for three years, Gibbs Hall Jonathan, on Florida and M University's Jonathan, campus, named after him. Oh, he so was, I know of that, that Gibbs. He was an up-and-coming man in Tallahassee. And then he died under very mysterious circumstances. We still don't know what exactly happened to Jonathan Gibbs. But mm. um, he was known throughout the state as a radical Republican, as an up-and-coming black man. He dressed in the finest clothes available at the time. Mm. And he went to a dinner, gave a very powerful speech. It was said in the papers. Went home and died. Perfectly healthy man. All of a sudden, he's dead. Mm. There's a belief that he was poisoned. And he probably was poisoned. There's no explanation for his death. And that was the end of him. Josiah Walls was um, a congressman. He was a former Union soldier, fought for the Union in Florida. Uh, A lot of black men who fought in the Civil War for the Union mustered out of the Union Army in Gainesville, in Alachua County. Mm -hmm. So he had a cadre of former military men who were available for public office in and around Gainesville. Okay. And so we had a number of figures appointed um, based upon the fact that they lived in Alachua County. Why did Reconstruction fail? Land. When the Civil War was drawing to a, a close, 1865, there was a meeting in Savannah. General Sherman mm-hmm. was there, uh, as was uh, Stanton, Edmund Stanton, who was Lincoln's Secretary of War. Mm-hmm. They met with 19 black pastors in Savannah and asked them, what will the former slaves want? when the war is over. What is most important to the Negroes once the war ends? And the 19 men to a person all gave the same answer, land. That the slaves have land that they have lived on for generations. Give them parcels of land, they will work it and pay the government back over time. But that's what blacks want. That's what the former slaves want. They want their own system of of farming. That sort of led to what became known as the 40 acres and a mule, where Sherman then uh, signed this executive order, 15 I think the number of it was, which said that um, certain land plantations that have been confiscated from uh, plantation owners should be divided up 40 acres per family. Uh, he didn't say anything about mules. That came mm-hmm. one of his underling just threw in some mules, broken down army mules. But he said the land would be divided. And so about 40,000 blacks, former slaves, did get land, 40 acres. Uh, and then it was taken away from them. Uh, but Andrew Johnson ascended to the presidency following Lincoln's assassination. Mm-hmm. Uh, Andrew Johnson changed all of that, no allocation of lands to former slaves. The land was given back to the plantation owners. Listen, the men who had left the plantations, the white men who left to go and fight America, fight the Union, ended up getting the land when they came back home because that's when Andrew Johnson, President of the United States, uh, decreed. So even those former slaves who had been given land were evicted. White establishment in the South or the North wanted slaves to have 40 acres and a mule. What the North wanted was for those textile mills in the North Mm -hmm. to be able to get cotton the same way they got cotton before the Civil War. And they were not going to get that by having slaves working 40 acres with a mule. They needed the plantations back the way they were to sustain the the wealth in the North Mm -hmm. that came from the South. And that's why there was little or no Northern opposition to the end of Reconstruction. The North was tired of of the aftermath of the war. They wanted their troops back home, and they wanted to be done with it. The view was that now that the war is over, the former plantation owners will go in and paternalistically take care of the slaves and reorganize the economy, and we'll be sending cotton back up to New York as fast as we can. That leads us to another question that I dealt with in my own uh, mind and research for years. Was the Civil War an economic war, or was it a war to free slaves? It, well, it was an economic and a political war. It became a war to free, to free the slaves later on. Lincoln decided that. But the initial impetus for the war was the Union. 
who was not allowing the union to disintegrate. Right. And there were enough people who felt on, on the side of the North that that was worth fighting and dying for. But as the war progressed, it became more of um, an effort to free the slaves, um, moving the, the reason of the purpose of the war to a higher level. So uh, it became the stated purpose was to free the slaves. But basically, it was a political and economic conflict between the North and the South. Yeah, well, you know, Lincoln's uh, statement, a nation divided cannot stand, he was referring to the North and the South because the South was going to split, right, right. Uh, okay. from, from the Union and all of that. But the reason that the South was threatening and did start printing their own money and all that kind of stuff, the reason that that they were doing that, I thought, was because of the pressure that was placed on them uh, financially, not really because they owned slaves. That's why I wondered whether or not the whole thing was really about money. Or well, it was about, about money, uh, bro, because slaves were money. What determined one's wealth during this time was not land. It was slaves. Slave right, exactly. Own. Land was virtually free. But, and, and, but, and remind our young listeners now, uh, many of our past presidents owned slaves. Yeah, about eight of them owned slaves. The only okay. the only former president that freed slaves was George Washington. All the rest okay. of them kept their slaves. Hmm. Um, but where were we at? You were saying that your wealth was really... Right, in slaves. So if there was a law passed by Northerners that you can't have slaves, that means I can't have my wealth. You're taking my money. To hell with having land, if you can't work it and get some cotton growing or sugar or something, then you might as well not have the land. So what the North did was to attack the very essence of the Southern economic structure and process with abolishing slavery. Bro, thank you very much. You've done an excellent job of informing us about uh, slavery and, uh, and America, part one and part two, uh, gives us a good summation of that. Okay, we want to remind our listeners to join us next week. Our next episode will be on lynching. You'll find that a very interesting topic. I'm Dr. Raymond Dunn. I'm Dr. Marvin Dunn. And we'll see you on the next episode. Are you an artist looking for a place to record high quality vocals to meet a certain standard? Are you looking for a certified audio engineer that was trained to work in any recording environment and proficient in Pro Tools? Are you looking for sound design, music production, movie scores, or production for any multimedia project? What about learning how to produce and operate Pro Tools? All of these things can be accomplished by working with producer AV of Clockwork Track. Stay locked into at Clockwork305 on IG for updates and further details. To set up a session, AV can be reached at 305-812-9292. Let Clockwork Track service all of your audio production needs. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Aris Crown All Natural Products and Clockwork Tracks for providing our podcast music. Special thanks also to our editor, Track 53, as well as HGAB Studios and MRD2 Media. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at TBE Unfiltered, or go to our website at tbeunfiltered.com. And when you do, don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. See you next week. Mm-hmm.